Okay, guys, uh, let's get started. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, heterogeneous systems architecture. And the approach I want to take here is I want to introduce you to the HSA Foundation. And I want to base this talk on what's actually happening in the foundation. And I want to conclude the talk with what HSA does to a driver stack, right? Because, you know, you've seen driver stacks. You probably, if you've run things on the GPU, you know what happens when you need to submit something. And you know what happens when you need to, you know, send memory over to the GPU. And, you know, so, so let's, so we'll, we'll go through HSA, talk a little bit about the intermediate language, which is HSAIL, and let's conclude with a positive note on what technology like this does to a software, to a driver software stack. And you know, please ask questions as we are going through the presentation. Don't hesitate to do that. If you want to hold off your questions towards then, that's okay too. It's up to you. I don't mind either ways. Uh, I can continue the flow without uh, without any problem. So uh, let's let's start with some terminology. Um, HSA is heterogeneous systems architecture. Please note that it's not just GPUs. And I'll talk about why it's not just GPUs in a little bit. And that's really important to understand. Um, HSA component is a terminology that defines an IP that satisfies architecture requirements and provides features that have been identified to be HSA. So HSA component is an IP that satisfies all the requirements that you need to be a HSA device. So I'll talk over what these requirements are. When we go through the driver stack, we'll actually see each of these requirements and what these requirements actually do to help the state of the art today, to improve the state of the art today. SOC is system on chip. It's a collection of various IPs. As I said earlier, in the AMD APU infrastructure, the SOC has AMD CPU cores and the excellent graphics IP we have. It's possible to com you know, conceive companies that are just building parts of this IP. For example, you have a system on chip and you can con it's possible to conceive a scenario where other companies are building different parts of the IP that go on the system on chip. HSA is an open architecture. It's a very powerful open architecture that enables great things like this. An agent is, HSA agent is something that can participate in a HSA memory subsystem. And I'll talk about what a memory subsystem is. But one point that I wanted to get across in this slide is that this means it respects page sizes, memory protection properties, which means the GPU in an APU respects the page sizes and memory protection properties and shares the TLBs with the CPU. It shares the TLBs. We have explicit memory management unit called HSA MMU that lets you access the same pages from the CPU and the GPU and they share a TLB. This is a really powerful concept. And I'll, I'll, talk, a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about what this does to your programming models. You, you look at the plethora of languages that are supported on accelerators and you'll see how this is really amazing. I have a slide on that. We'll get to it very quickly. So uh, I talked quite a bit about the foundation when I started. I have another slide on the foundation, but I wanted to give you perspective of HSA from the foundation's point of view. There are four major parts that are being worked in the HSA foundation. And as I mentioned, there are a lot of participants in the foundation that are coming together to define these things. One of the main things is the systems architecture. Systems architecture from a hardware point of view it describes the requirements that you have to follow to build a HSA system. It specifies shared memory, it specifies what kind of cache coherency you have to follow and what kind of cache coherency you have to guarantee. It specifies the concept of clocks, it talks about context switching, it has information on memory-based signaling and topology. So this, this is kind of a requirements document that tells you if you follow all these requirements then you've built a HSA system. There is a programmer's reference working group that's defining HSAIL. There are a lot of cool instructions in HSAIL. If you have programmed on GPU before and you've seen problems with divergence, 
where divergence is very, it's so, it's, it hurts performance so much in many scenarios. If you've seen problems with divergence, HeadSail has over 10 cross-lane operations that help you understand the kind of divergence that your code is going through. And these are really powerful. It has an instruction to yield, uh, to give a hint to the hardware that you can yield. It's a really powerful language. It's a, the, the language is being defined, the spec has been ratified and released, and any member of the HSA Foundation can access these things. The Runtime API is an API that uh, wraps the system architecture features through a very lightweight mechanism. It gives you ability to create user mode queues. And I'll talk about what user mode queues are and what you can do with them in a little bit. It has API to control execution. So you have ability to control individual kernels, you have ability to control execution. It has API for that, which means you can launch a kernel and then control its execution. It has API to support different tools like profilers and debuggers. And this API is being defined by the runtime working group. So that's one of, there's a third component in the HSA foundation. The fourth part is the tools working group. The tools working group is just starting in the HSA foundation. And we, the, the objective of the tools working group is to come up with things to support profilers and debuggers. This includes things like how do you go from a lower level instruction language to a higher level instruction language. How do you map between these two? Because once you go through a lot of optimizations, things change, things change in the code. Tools Working Group will create API and they'll, they'll define how you map between different levels of, of the instruction or, or, the, or the intermediate representations. These are four major components of HSA, a la HSA Foundation. Now I just wanted to talk a little bit about the evolution of HSA to why we have this technology and how it led to the evolution of this technology. Now we, AMD is built, has a lot of experience in building CPUs, has built some really awesome CPUs. Our graphics IP is exceptional. We've seen what happened to CM, CMOS technology and we've hit a wall with that. It's a natural evolution from, from, from here to include graphics IP as a part, as a first class citizen in general purpose compute. The key word here is first class citizen. And that's what we have done with HSA. We've taken this, we've taken a multi-pronged approach. We've first integrated the hardware. And we, you've seen hardware like Lano and Richland that came out of AMD that did not have all the HSA features. It did not have the graphics core next that AMD has. But the products that you're going to see coming out of AMD in the future have graphics core next and have all the HSA features. And as I said before, I'm going to walk you through some of these features and show you what they do to, to, an, to a language, to a software stack. In the past, the memory management unit was still evolving. Now we have an advanced MMU, HSA MMU, that can handle multiple page requests simultaneously. So you can have multiple kernels running and have them handle multiple page requests simultaneously. Now, uh, we have done the architectural and systems integration. We now have a fully evolved memory management unit that when you're running a kernel on a GPU, it needs any memory, any system memory. The memory management unit can page it in and let you access that memory. It provides same level support for tools as the CPU. This is a really powerful concept. So the building tools for HSA, and this is very important. If you programmed on GPUs before, if you see how long it took tools to evolve, the approach we are taking with HSA is we are building a whole lot of this ecosystem uh, by the time the HSA hardware gets released. Now, we, you know, we have support for context switching, preemption, full coherence, this helps things like simulators, you can do checkpoints. The beauty in, in HSA is that you can conceive in the future a checkpoint that cannot just checkpoint your process, but your user mode queues as well. The queues that contain the tasks that you're running on the GPU. It has the ability to do something like that. It's a really powerful uh, concept. So we started with APUs uh, where we put graphics IP on the node. In the future, you can conceive other kinds of IP that, that, that are, that's a part of a HSA system on chip intercom. So you can, you can conceive you know, many other kinds of IP that can be part of this. 
So, you know, we believe in the SOC methodology they have arrived and a tremendous advancement and, you know, SOCs, when you have a HSA SOC, it, it's a really cool concept that lets you put different IP on the HSA SOC. Um, so, we, we went through an approach where we thought of how to make things even better in the SOC methodology. So, the HSA concepts that I'm going to show you later, they'll kind of give you a perspective of how we have improved the state of the art in GPGPU program. It, so early focus, as I've mentioned before, is an APU, which is CPU with GPU compute accelerators, but this can go way beyond uh, a regular accelerator. So bulk synchronous parallelism, that's easy. There is, we can easily deal with it. It's not, it's not a challenge. We have an outstanding support for task-based parallelism. And the reason why I say it is outstanding is that it only today takes 256 threads to sufficiently fill the pipeline to get maximum performance for a compute unit. The launch is very, very quick. And the launch is very, very quick because I'll talk about the queuing model, which in our queuing model, we have defined a language called AQL and there are 64 bytes that you need to write to a queue to launch a task on a GPU. So it's very, very quick to launch a task on a GPU. After you write the bytes, you have to ring a doorbell and that tells the scheduler that there is work that needs to be done. The scheduler, whenever it gets scheduled, picks up the work and then executes it. There is uh, support for execution schedules. So this helps, if you think of compiler targets, so HSA has barrier packets and different kinds of packets. So you can write a dispatch followed by a packet that specifies the dependencies that need to be resolved before you execute the next thing. So which means you can have a schedule written in your queue where you specify what things need to execute before the next kernel gets launched. So for example, if you ran four kernels, if you launched four kernels in HSA in a queue, when you launch a kernel, it merely indicates that the execution will start in thread order. It doesn't give any guarantees about when these kernels will finish. We have a different mechanism to identify when things are finished. We call that signals and I have a few slides that cover what signals are. So when you launch a few kernels and then you want to put a packet here that says, when all these kernels finish, then launch the next kernel. So you're basically creating a schedule. So if you're a compiler writer and you think of how you write DAGs or how you create DAGs out of this, this is this is how HSA helps. So you can create a schedule and then put the whole schedule on the queue and things will execute. Um, as I talk, talked about AQL before, it's architected queuing language. It's a really powerful uh, mechanism. Uh, the advantage of AQL is that the packet size is fixed, it's 64 bytes. Once you write a packet to AQL, that describes the execution or it describes a dependency. And AQL is very, very rich in that sense. Um, and it helps you launch tasks very, very quickly. We have advanced language support. Now, when you think about the state of the art today in GPU computing and why you can't support a whole lot of programming languages on GPUs, it is because of a concept of, you know, one of the main reasons is there is this thing called a function closure. So when you want to run something on a GPU in a traditional programming language, you have to create a function closure that describes everything the function that you need to run can access. This is very difficult to do because the function could be doing pointer chasing. You don't know what memory the function is going to access. So to create a closure for a function that tells everything a function can access is very difficult to do typically. In HSA, it's not a problem because in HSA, any kernel can access the heap or stack or any system memory for that process. So function closures become a piece of cake. So because function closures become a piece of cake, the number of languages that can be supported in HSA, it's amazing. You can think of people are afraid of C because it has pointers and pointer chain. You technically can think of supporting languages like C and C++ in a HSA system. It's a really powerful system in that sense. It has very advanced language support for function calls, virtual functions, exception handling, and things like that. 
So I wanted to cover, as I told you earlier, I'll, uh, I wanted to show you the different parts that the foundation is accessing, and I also wanted to show you what the foundation is doing. It was founded in June 2012. It's developing a new platform. The first specification is already published and is available on the website. That was the specification for the programmer's reference manual, which talks about the head sale language, the binary representation for head sale, and code objects that you need to run on the GPU. And this, uh, this specification is available. You can look at it. There are additional specifications for the other three parts that I talked about that are still being developed in the foundation. If you are a member of the foundation, for specifications that are already being developed, you get the opportunity to contribute. There are different membership levels. You can log on to the HSA Foundation website and see all the different membership levels and then determine if you want to be a part of the foundation and contribute to the architecture, this is what you can do. This is a list, uh, this is not a full list. The, mem the, the number of members are increasing very, very quickly. We have a lot of lot more members than what's shown here. But you can see that the founders are MediaTek, AMD, Qualcomm, ARM, Samsung, Imagination, and Texas Instruments. These are the founders of the HS, founding members of the HSA Foundation. We have many other membership levels that I talked about. We have promoters, supporters, contributors, academic memberships, and associates. Many national labs are members of the HSA Foundation. Um, national labs like Argonne and Sandia, they are, these are members of the HSA Foundation. It's an open platform. It's, uh, the standards are royal, distributed in a royalty-free manner. And this is how we are promoting the next evolution in architecture. AMD did 64-bit architecture, created Open64.org, and did a lot of, you know, a lot of companies followed AMD there. We are doing something similar with HSA Foundation here. This is an open standard. We are defining the next step in architecture, and we are promoting it so that other people can, can adopt it and, and implement things. I briefly wanted to cover the memory model. The HSA memory model is based on what is called as RCSC. RCSC stands for Relaxed Consistency SQL Consistency. It is possible to implement something like C++ or OpenCL or other memory models using RCSC. Now, the C++ memory model, technically speaking, is weaker than RCSC. It's based on something called PCSC. But it is possible to implement the C++ memory model using RCSC. So HSA is very powerful in that sense. It for the RCSC memory model allows you to implement a lot of other stricter memory models or even weaker support weaker memory models at the same time. Um, the queuing model is very interesting. In HSA, user mode queue is basically a mechanism to launch a task for execution on the GPU. In a user mode queue, we've defined a language we call AQL. So when you write a packet in the queue, and writing a packet in the queue is done through loads and stores, like regular memory loads and stores. And the packet size, as I said earlier, is 64 bytes. When you write a packet in HSA into a queue, you are essentially describing an execution. Once you write a packet and you ring the doorbell, the scheduler knows that you have something to execute and can pick it up eventually and then execute. Now, the advantage of this user mode queue model is since writing a packet is basically based on loads and stores, you can imagine writing a packet in many different programming languages, and you can imagine writing a packet from the kernel that's running in the GPU. So nested NQs are as efficient as regular NQs because they do basically do the same thing. They write to memory, and they ring a doorbell. The self-NQ, as I mentioned now, it enables a lot of solutions. It enables recursions, tree travels, uh, tree traversals, and wavefront reformatting. Now, HeadSail is an intermediate language, as I mentioned before. It's lower level than the OpenCL sphere. It fits naturally in the OpenCL compilation stack. It is suitable to support many different high-level languages. It's really powerful in that sense. It's explicitly parallel, so it's designed for data parallel. And uh, the concept revolves around the work item that you need to execute. Is the intermediate language for parallel compute in HSA. Typically, it is generated from a higher level compiler or a higher level intermediate representation, such as an LLVM IR. Uh, in the AMD's compilation stack for OpenCL, the head sale is generated 
through LLVM IR where patterns, stable gen patterns are identified and we compile it down. There are a lot of features in HeadSail. It's parallel, it supports shared virtual memory, it's portable across vendors in HSA Foundation. It, con it, it has consistent numerical results. It's it has very good performance and one of the key things about HeadSail is it's just a tad above lowest level instruction set architecture on AMD's hardware, which means even if you were to conceive a solution where you are compiling online, the compilation step will be very, very quick. It's a very single, in most cases, it's a single step translation to the lower level answer. So it's a really powerful language in that sense. We've given it a lot of thought when we designed it. Uh, the SIMT execution model is, is what the head sale uh, presents. Um, there is a hardware implementation. There are many advantages of the SIMT execution model. Easier to program, natural path for mainstream programming models. It's scalable across a wide variety of hardware. Crossline operations, as I mentioned before, are available for people who want to optimize performance when they have issues with divergence. This is a really powerful thing. It's available in head sale. The compilation technology, we, we really are vested in Clang. And by having a backend and front end for different languages, we envision a scenario where we can support all, a lot of the languages that you see in the top box above. Now, let me walk you through a few features that are currently de being defined in the HSA working groups. And these, are the, these, are, these directly translate to requirements in a HSA system. Now, some of the key features are unified addressing across all processors, all compute units, all HSA components, and all HSA agents, as I've defined the terminology earlier. Operation into pageable system memory. And I told you how many things this can solve. When you want to build function closures, when you want to do pointer chasing, when you want to do recursive NQs, it really helps in doing all those things. There is full memory coherence. That's a really nice advantage. Um, full memory coherence enables coherent accesses between, in an APU, if you look at an APU, between the GPU, the graphics IP, and the CPU, you can have full coherent access. Um, so you can, you know, you can write something in the GPU, read it immediately in the CPU, or do vice versa. And the coherent access enables a lot of other programming modes. I've talked about user mode dispatch. That lets you do dispatches from you know, GPU or CPU by writing 64 bytes and ringing a doorbell. We have an architected queuing language that defines how to represent a dispatch. We have high-level support for GPU compute processors. And we have things like preemption and context switching. Now, let's see what, uh, how it you know, solves some of the challenges that you're seeing today. Uh, today's challenges, you can't share pointers. You have to copy data. HSA addresses that. It's, you know, the emerging solution that, that we have in the near future, immediate future, you can actually experiment with something like this. Um, there are, you know, it, it, it helps bring GPU compute to existing programming languages. Not go and define a new language that you need to have for GPU compute, but then say, you have higher level languages that can be supported using this GPGPU kind of solution, the GPU compute solution. So let's, and I talked about the driver stack and I've talked about what the HSA does to the driver stack. Um, these slides were made by someone else. I'm just using them. Uh, the credit goes to the person who made the slides. Um, you have applications, OS, and the GPU. So typically in today's model, you have to transfer the buffer to the GPU. When you transfer the buffer, the OS has to do, has to come in and schedule either a copy or do a map for you. And the OS tells you, I've done the copy or done the map. And now you go and schedule the job. And again, you have to go to the OS to say, please schedule the job for me on the GPU. The OS starts the job on the GPU. The job is finished. Schedules the application again. OS has to say, the job has finished. The application needs to be scheduled again. And then you have to do a get buffer to get your data back. At the end of all this cycle, you still have to go back to the OS to do a copy or a map 
before you can access the data. So it's a lot of trips that you have to do to the OS and to the GPU, and you this this is really you know the the it, it ends up with someone who looks like this at the end of this whole process. So it's a very painful process. Now let's see some of the HSA features and what they do to this state of the art. One of the nice features in HSA is when you look at the uh, what what happens today, you have memory system for the CPU, you have a memory subsystem for the GPU. Sometimes the GPU system could be physical, sometimes it may have its own virtual address space. You have two different physical memories, multiple different virtual multiple different virtual address spaces. With HSA, you have one virtual memory address space that is accessible both to CPU and the GPU. The physical memory is shared within this virtual address space. That's a nice feature. Now, when you, the advantages are there are no mapping tricks, you can send pointers, not data. The implications are there are common page tables and common interpretation of architectural semantics, such as sharing of page tables and protection and things like that. There are common mechanisms for address translation and servicing address translation faults. That's also a very powerful concept. The concept of a process address space ID, which means the process ID is recognized even by the GPU, and that's how you can act. You can allow access to the same virtual memory for a task that you submit on the GPU. Now, the advantage of something like this is that you don't have to copy or map memory anymore. You don't have to copy and map memory when you're done with the job, but you still have the transfer buffer and get buffer. The reason why you have this still, despite this, is that the memory may not be coherent, so you may have to do something here to flush the CPU caches. You may have to do something towards the end to flush the GPU caches. But the, there are some, some specifications of the shared virtual memory. HSA specifies that the minimum supported virtual address width is 48 bits for a 64-bit system and 32 bits for a 32-bit system. The HSA agents are allowed to res reserve virtual address ranges to do fancier things if they wanted to. Um, Read-write permissions apply to all participants in HSA equally. So now let's add cache coherence into the mix. HSA, as I've told you before and showed you in the slide as a list of HSA features, ha supports cache coherency across memory accesses between the CPU and the GPU. It doesn't mean GPU and CPU don't have their own caches. They still have their own caches. Despite the, despite the fact that they have you know, the top two levels of caches, cache coherency is still maintained. So this is this is an excerpt from the from the HS the, the systems architecture specification that kind of tells you what kind of what cache coherency is supported. The advantages are it supports composability, it reduces the complexity when you have to communicate things between the agents. For example, when you have to ask the agent to access some memory that you have just written, all it has to do is access it. You don't need to do any other explicit communication or cache flush for it to be able to access the memory. It's a lower barrier point of entry when you're porting software. So today, when you port software to the GPU, you have a completely different methodology. You have to think what data this program needs to access, prepare for transferring it ahead of time, transfer it, launch your job, and transfer it back. This and changes, this kind of makes portability a lot easier when you think about it. <clears throat> the implications are hardware coherence is supported between all, ad, all HSA agents. It can take many forms. There can be standalone snoop filters, combined LT filters, and snoop based systems. There are many other choices that are possible here. So, what the, this does is that you don't need that transfer buffer to GPU step anymore. Because it's coherent, you know that when the job starts, any memory it accesses will actually snoop the caches in the CPU. So you don't need to do any additional step to start the job. The same thing applies to the last step. You don't need to get the buffer or do any additional step to synchronize caches between the GPU and the CPU. Once the job is done, when the CPU needs to access the data, it gets the latest copy of the data. So, you know, we are you know getting closer to getting rid of all the unnecessary steps that you've seen in the in the diagram. Now let's talk a bit about a concept in HSA called signaling. Signaling 
the, the HSA has this concept of signaling, which is in essence a communication mechanism. There is API in the HSA runtime to create signal objects, and there are instructions in HSA language to send a signal. You can send a signal in HSA language and have another kernel wait on a signal or have your host wait on a signal through API and vice versa is also possible. You can send a signal using HSA runtime API, write an instruction in HSA that waits on this signal and then there's something. So signal is a very interesting mechanism because it abstracts some of the cool hardware you can build that's power efficient to communicate between from the GPU and the CPU. In HSA, you can still communicate using system memory. Um, you can directly access the signaling objects from any HSA agent or HSA component. Uh, you can query the current signaling object to see what the value at the signaling object is. You can do all kinds of atomics on the signaling object. Now, the advantages of signaling is it, it, it enables asynchronous interrupts between HSA agents that, that are involved with the kernel. It's a very, you know, it's a nice idiom for work offload. It allows for low power waiting. So when you're building hardware that enables low power waiting, this allows for you to use that hardware for waiting on executions. The thing is runtime support will be required because you need to use an API call to wait on a signal. Um, but on the head sale side, there are instructions to work with signals. Now with signals, the advantage is that you don't have to depend on the OS to schedule your application. You can directly communicate to your kernel using signals. Now, so we are almost there. We have eliminated, if you look back, you know, we have eliminated a lot of the steps. There are still a few steps we need to eliminate. You know, we have, you still have to queue the job and we are still relying on the OS to schedule the job and then start the job on the GPU, right? So we still have reliance on these two things. One of the really nice things in HSA is user mode queuing. As I have described you before, there are a lot of advantages of user mode queuing. It allows you to write packets that represent dispatches directly into system memory and let the scheduler on your GPU know that it has work it needs to pick up. No OS involvement, just hardware support for, for scheduling. The queue in HSA is architected. Now, this is a really powerful concept. By architecting a queue, we are giving hardware awareness to a HSA queue. So when you write something in the queue and you do the necessary doorbell ringing, the hardware picks it up. There is no need for driver involvement. So there are there is support for multiple process IDs and this allows you to run multiple applications that share the GPU hardware, schedule work onto the queues at the same time. That's also a very powerful con concept. The advantages are, you know, you avoid kernel or driver when dispatching work onto the GPU. You have a lot lower latency for a dispatch because if you think of how I defined the dispatch, you could probably get a feel for what the latency could be for something so, you know, something so simple. Um, standard memory protection mechanisms can be used. It allows for that. The implications are the packet fields, the entire packet, every byte in the packet is architected. It is understood by the GPU hardware. So it's a really powerful concept. It guarantees backward compatibility. Packets are enqueued and dequeued via an architected protocol. And uh, let's talk a little more on this later. But what this does is that when the application needs to queue a job, it doesn't need to go to the OS. You remove OS from the mix here. Now, we've started with this, with a diagram that had so many steps for you to run something on the GPU. Now you queue a job, put something, write a few bytes to user mode queue. The GPU scheduler can eventually pick it up and start the job. It finishes the job, signals back, you're done. So this is very, very powerful. This, this is not, you know, we are really changing the way you would do GPU programming or think about the entire software architecture to start with. So, I want to talk a little bit about an application that we worked on called suffix arrays. They are fundamental data structures. They are designed for efficiently searching um, of a large text. Uh, they quickly locate every you know, occurrence of a substring S in a, in a, in a text T. Uh, suffix arrays are used to accelerate in-memory cloud workloads. 
um, full text index searches, lossless data comp compression, they are used in bioinformatics a lot. So the, the key point here that I want to drive back is that by porting the suffix arrays to, to our uh, APUs and by you know, kind of running it, increased performance, great. You know, it's using GPU now, so it has a lot more compute power. 5.8 times performance increase. But the most beautiful part is five times lower power for the same application with 5.8 times performance increase. So this is what we are targeting. You know, this is this is our this is how we see this evolve. We see a lot of applications evolving. Lower power, better performance, easier to program. That's the HSMSI.